Okay. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming to uh, hear about power and truth, um, two, two big uh, topics. Um, I'm John Baskin. I'm an editor of uh, the magazine called The Point, a magazine of philosophical essays based uh, in the United States. And um, I'm honored. You okay. I'm honored to be here with uh, Stephen Lukes, um, a professor of sociology. Uh, Stephen is a professor of sociology at New York University, formerly a fellow of politics and sociology at Oxford. Um, he's the author of several notable books, including an acclaimed intellectual history of Emil Durkheim, a study of the political and intellectual concept of individualism, and also a highly praised novel uh, framed as a modern update on Candide entitled The Curious Enlightenment of Professor Caritat. Uh, Professor Lukes' study of power, which is entitled Power, A Radical View and published in 1973, uh, is still a landmark work in academic theory about power and uh, will be of obvious interest to us today as we explore the relation between power and truth which is one subject of a new collection of essays um, he's working on. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about Professor Lukes, but uh, we've got to get to the bottom of power and truth. Um, so to set up this discussion, uh, Professor Lukes asked me to start by reading two quotations from the famous essay by Hannah Arendt, Truth and Politics, an essay she originally published in The New Yorker in 1967. Um, the first quotation, which is the second sentence of the essay, is, no one has ever doubted that truth and politics are on rather bad terms with each other. And no one, as far as I know, has ever counted truthfulness among the political virtues. And the second, which comes a few sentences later, is sort of the question that structures the essay. She asks, is it of the very essence of truth to be impotent and of the very essence of power to be deceitful? So, I think to read these things now, um, you know, it's, it's easy to immediately think of political situations we're all familiar with, including in the country we live in, in the United States, and things we've heard all weekend about um, governments in Russia and the sort of, um, you know, we just heard about uh, Hungary. And um, th this idea, there's an idea, at least in the sort of liberal press, a lot of the time, that one of the problems in these governments is that there's an assault on truth and facts. Um, Timothy Snyder said on Friday that, you know, we've had this retreat from factuality and we need to reassert uh, factuality in our, in our politics. Um, and there's sort of an idea that if we could return these politicians to the facts, um, we would be better off and people would see the error of their ways. Um, I guess in view of these Arendt quotes um, about the sort of incompatibility of truth and power, and there's a long political philosophical history of thinking about politics in terms of power more so than truth, um, I sort of wanted to start with a sort of counterintuitive question of sort of what makes us think that politics has anything to do with truth? And, um, you know, what, what are the different roles that truth plays in different kind of ideas of politics? Is this working? I don't know. I don't? Yeah, okay. So, these are big questions, these are big concepts, I mean, or rather there are concepts which we could spend a lot of time, but I'm not going to do that being pedantic. What do we mean by power? What do we mean by truth? But just to respond to what you just said, well, why should politics have anything to do with truth? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, let's, let's make a distinction between truth with a small t and big truth with big capital T. So, and, and so big truth would be like metaphysical truths, truths about the human condition, truth about what life is about, truths, truths that are about moral and, and, and religious issues. And then there's small truths which just have to do with um, how many people attended Trump's inaugural, um, inaugural? or um, uh, you know, how, many, how many Muslims live in France? I mean, factual questions. Um, or actually included in the same category, I'd say questions like, uh, is climate change happening? Uh, questions that, are, that scientists argue about. So let's make a distinction between small truths and big truths. Now, 
if we're talking about big truths, politics has certainly had to do with that, with, the, with these big truths. And since we're discussing Hannah Arendt, in part, she certainly was very, not in, these, not in this essay, not with these quotations, not in these quotations, but she was certainly very preoccupied by the idea that politics could be about the imposition of truth with big T upon whole societies. I mean, that's what totalitarianism was. It was the, the successful uh, imposition of big truth. And so there certainly is a history of politics being about that. And I would say liberalism, and certainly liberal democracy, is about ways of organizing political life in which those questions remain open and a matter of controversy and contest between different groups, different people, different kinds of people. So liberal democracy is about holding big truth questions in abeyance or rather having a kind of, I suppose, let's say impartiality, even neutrality, though that's always problematic, in which the state and political, uh, political life is a matter of not imposing big truth on everybody. But if we're talking about small truths, that's to say, and, and really they're not so small, truths about how the world works, the, 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 uh, the, the product of science and social science as well, then I think politics, if, you, if your question is should politics be concerned with that, my answer is of course, because if it isn't, it's not going to be effective. Well, but I mean, I guess this is a question of what, what effective politics is, because right. uh, Trump, obviously, in some regard, has been quite effective. And uh, he has yeah. very little regard, I mean, effective in the sense of winning. He, and he has very little right. regard for small truth in this sense, in the sense of facts. And you quote uh, this this new book by Amanda Carpenter, yeah. uh, she's the author of a new book, a forthcoming book called Gaslighting America. Um, and she says that many who vote for Trump, confronted with evidence of falsehoods, he tells, do not see deception, they see commitment to winning. Right. And I guess there's a question, I mean, what, there, is, is, is it a valid form of politics to say, I'm not gonna let the truth get in the way of winning? I mean, isn't that, from the p purely right. political perspective, a reasonable thing to do. Yeah, well, this raises the, the other part of what I, I, I certainly want to say. I mean, it's obviously you're right that Trump and Republicans who are kind of slavishly following him are um, fully engaged in befuddling people, in, in, in telling lies. Actually, I think it's worse than that. It's more what, what we could call bullshitting in the sense it's getting people not it's not just lying to people, it's getting people to somehow accept. That's what gaslighting means, I suppose. Yeah. Accept the fact that they're told lots of lies and it kind of doesn't matter. Um, so uh, it's true that uh, Trump and the Republicans have been doing this. And, but on the other hand, um, the, the, I, whether that's gonna work over the long term, uh, we'll see. Um, but, but as for politics, I think that um, politics is, is, one way of thinking about politics is, is, is to ask what it is, which is what Hannah Arendt is raising here. And one way of thinking about politics is just to see it in a very reductive way as, as, as somewhat, as like war, in which the only, um, the only issue is to win. And that's the way Trump is clearly operating. And that's the way Republicans are operating right now. That's to say, politics is just a, a game in which, a very serious game, in which the, the point is to defeat the enemy, is to defeat the, uh, the other side. So polarization is, is the name of the game. And um, there, uh, you can uh, manipulate people, or rather you can manipulate truths in such a way that doing that is part of what you do. Part, that's part of the game. Um, so, uh, yes, I think uh, if you think that politics is just a matter of winning at all costs, then you can 
for a time, um, just uh, treat small truths as entirely, uh, you know, up for grabs. And so this is, um, you develop in your, some of your notes for this chapter, yeah. this idea of why politics in this respect is different from some other realms uh, that are concerned with truth. For yeah. instance, yeah, journalism or right. uh, the judiciary. So what I think is this. I think that, uh, you know, truths, and I call them small truths, of course they're very important, big truths in the sense that, you know, the, the, I, by, by small truths I mean truths about how the world works, empirical truths, factual truths. So I think uh, one way to think about what makes politics different is this way. I think that there are various, let's call them fields, I use that term uh, in, the, in the sense in which Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist, used it. Fields being areas of life in which people are both cooperating and competing with each other, competing for resources but also for reputation, in which the search for truth, ways of arriving at truths, are the name of the game. That's what you do. So in science, for instance, scientists gain success by arriving at theories which other scientists acknowledge to be true, acknowledge, or at least acknowledge to be better than, the, than what existed before. So science is a, a field in which truth is, is what they are, um, or, 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 I mean, you could have endless discussions about this, but I'm being, trying to simplify. I think science is about tracking truths. Similar, and looking for evidence, I mean, or rather finding theoretical answers to questions where evidence is crucial and has to be well, uh, has to be found and, and, and not faked, not falsified. Similarly with journalism. S journalists go in for fact-checking. Real journalists who respect one another as journalists if their stories are well backed by evidence. Uh, Take the law. Law similarly has to be, if it's going to be functioning properly, a, a, an arena of life, a field in which the, the successful prosecutions or successful success in, in, in engaging in the law requires appeal to evidence. So that too is a profession that's fact checking or fact, factually based because evidence matters. What I think is this, just briefly, I think politics, politics is not a field like those because, and this goes back to your first question of why, uh, you know, uh, what politics has to do with truth. I think you can think of politics as a field of indeed, of competition in which reputations are at stake and it's clearly a competition for resources. But the very question of what the game is, is itself a political question. So that if you want to engage in politics, or if you conceive that politics is really just about winning, if, if you take that reductive view, then you can dispense with, or you can, you can deal with the truth question in, in that way. You can say, okay, I'll, I'll just lie, or I'll engage in bullshitting. So you've changed the game to that. It's just winning. And you can treat, which is what the, um, I think the Trump uh, agenda has been, you can treat concerns with science, with uh, uh, truth tracking and so forth, you can treat that as something you, you want to discredit. So uh, in, in the piece that you read, uh, which, which I like to quote, which is um, by uh, a, a speech by Rush Limbaugh, you know, the radio, radio shock jock, uh, saying, we've got our own reality. They've got theirs. They being who? Scientists, academics, and so on. Uh, and we're winning. And you can find several statements by uh, Trump supporters. Indeed, uh, I, I seem to remember uh, under George Bush, someone said similarly, something very similar, that now we're in charge of reality. Well, it's actually a quote I was going to ask you yeah. about. is the Karl Rove, Karl Rove the yeah. advisor to President George W. Bush, who 
uh, you know, reprimanded a, a liberal journalist by saying, well, you're just, uh, you're just part of the reality-based community. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, so, and, you yeah. know, uh, liberals and journalists all made fun of him and, and thought this was such a travesty that, that this administration could be so uh, cavalier and, and make fun of people for being attached to reality. But, you know, there's a truth there about what politics are. He was saying, look, you, you're, 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 you're dealing with tracking reality. I'm doing something else. We're right. shaping reality. Yes, we're, yes. we're making a new reality. Yeah, so that's, what that shows is that politics, if you, under, if, you, if you see it in this very wide sense, politics is a, a, a place, the place, where you can actually just decide to engage in warfare and, and discredit these truth-tracking fields or institutions I'm talking about, which is exactly what we've been seeing uh, in America under Trump and elsewhere, where, but especially in America, you can um, discredit whole areas of science. You can attack the law. You can attack journalism, which is, and, and the media. Uh, um, and you can say, well, they don't count. And yeah, you mentioned that uh, Rush Limbaugh, I mean, this was in 2009, seven yeah. years before Trump, when he named, I think it's colorful, the, the, the four corners of deceit yes. being academia, public administration, journalism, and science, maybe. Yeah. I don't, um, and yeah, so I mean, I think that uh, this question then raises a really practical question. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that we have sort of there's a sort of, in terms of the struggle over what politics are right now, there's, there are sort of two sides, at least in the American context. There's the sort of deliberative, liberal democratic concept of politics, yeah. which still has, a, still, uh, there's an important place in that concept of politics for these transpartisan authorities that have some standards of truth which are not necessarily guided by politics. Um, whereas, uh, this sort of right-wing politics is, it, 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 that, that Limbaugh represents has been focused on discrediting those authorities yeah. for a long time and to some degree of success, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so then there's a question, sort of, how does the deliberative, uh, w when there's sort of an asymmetric, as you call it, attack on these institutions from the other side, does the deliberative uh, liberal um, concept, how does it respond? Well, before we get there, because that's the big practical question, what, what's, this, what's the implications of all this for how we should act and how, you know, what, kind of, what kind of politics we should engage in? But just before we get there, I'd just like to say, this is, this is I think, where we are. I mean, I think in the one way, I, I agree with, very much with Tim, Tim Snyder. We are in a new kind of situation now, relatively new, in which um, the, the contest that goes on, that historically always went on, for a century, I mean, between left and right, in various ways. That was a contest between, between what uh, Chantal Mouffe calls adversaries. Adversaries being people who are opposed to one another, who are fighting one another even, but who are playing the same game, who are engaged in some kind of, in a kind of contest in which there is, a, at some serious level, a mutual recognition that they're part of the same game, in which, uh, in which you concede defeat, if you're defeated, and which winning is playing by the rules of that game. Uh, and what I, and, and however, you could make the distinction, which she does, I think it's very helpful, between adversaries and enemies. Enemies don't care about what the rules are. In fact, enemies are quite willing, I mean, the point about an enemy is you win at all costs. And that, I think, I may be wrong, but it does seem to me that that has entered into the center of our politics in a way that is, is new. So that uh, in Trump's America now, and I think you see this very clearly, I have to say, in the most recent business with the Supreme Court, uh, the, nominee, the nomination of, uh, of, of Judge Kavanaugh, that the Republicans there, until now, seem to just be determined to win at all costs. And that um, idea, in other words, winning at all costs, is, is the name of the game now. In the name of the game, I use the phrase deliberately. In other words, you've changed the game. It's no longer a game between adversaries. It's a game in which one side 
is determined to win at all costs. And the other side, and this comes to your question, is then posed with the question, well, if you're on, on the other side, that's to say you're in some sense a, a com committed to liberal democratic institutions, you're, let's say, on the left, you're progressive, whatever terminology you want to use, what do you do? Do you go on to a war, fit, war footing? Or do you, in some way, try to uh, you know, uh, develop a strategy and tactics which, in some way, prefigure or represent and prefigure the kind of society you want, and in particular, a liberal democratic framework? And, and what's the answer? <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I should say I think this is like it's a really concrete issue that that comes up in so many different contexts. And I mean, we, you were just talking about the Kavanaugh, you know, the Supreme Court yeah. thing. I mean, there, there's as a liberal, you know, who's who watched what uh, what the Republicans did when President Obama nominated a Supreme Court judge and they just ignored it and refused to vote on him. There's a part of you that thinks, you know, it's tempting to think we should just do anything right. to block. That, you know, whatever rules we have to break, it doesn't matter. Whatever lies we have to tell, you know, abstracting from the case, from the individual case of what what has come up. But you yeah. might just think, look, it's justifiable. They did this, and and you know, there are a lot of people that feel that way. Um, but that would not be a prefigural politics no. necessarily in the way you're talk you're thinking of. Right. Well, I'd love to know what other people think about this. I mean, I think in the in the end, if you want my as it would most reflective or something thought about this. I think that in a way it does in the end depend upon how at some deep level how optimistic you are about about people. I mean if you really have a dark vision and you think as I think actually Foucault did that you know um, that, that in the end it is all the matter of I mean pol uh, Foucault even says politics is civil war. That's what we have to think of it as. Another dark such vision, of course, is Carl Schmitt. If you think that in the end it's all about friends and enemies, then I guess the answer is yes, you go on a, on a war footing. Uh, if you're on the left, why not? I mean, what I think is true, by the way, I want to say this just as in parenthesis. Uh, it's not as though I don't think, I mean, I do actually think we are all tribal. Uh, we've become very tribal, and that's to say, I think that the idea that we uh, are, you know, living in our own uh, cocoons or bubbles or silos or whatever people call them, that's true. But I also think that there's a point to being, I mean, th th that if you're on, let's say, on the left, or more importantly, which is what's at issue here, if you believe in a liberal democracy as the best kind of uh, framework within which to conduct politics. If you think that, as I do, I've never used the word liberal in my life, I don't think, as a term of abuse. Um, if that's your position, then to succumb to this view of politics, to engage in um, a win-at-all-costs strategy, is entirely self-defeating. Do you... Uh do you have a view of why you think there has been this shift in the, in the last, I mean, going back to 2009 or a bit before that, what, what has sort of, just as an, an, analy an analytical matter, like what, what has changed or has things changed in American politics or in the politics of some, some parts of Europe as well that have sort of um, thrown the game of politics into de debate in the way that it seems to be? It's not something I remember you know, no. from my childhood in the in the '90s, there was this sense that we'd reached a kind of consensus. Well, well about to remind what the game you, was. to remind you, at the end of the '90s, there was this book by um, uh, Fukuyama, "The End of History." Somehow, liberal democracy had triumphed, and um, that and maybe just short, you know, kind of short-term vision or something. But just if you think back to then, there has there has been a kind of tectonic shift. I think uh, certainly living in America, it's very clear to me. Um, the question of why, how to explain it, I mean, this is such a huge set of questions. I have no particular answer to give except maybe to think about the, what, 
what some people call the exhaustion, the exhaustion of the left, to the left de social democratic um, project, which obviously has a lot to do with the end of communism as the, as the alternative left project, which de was defeated by history and which then left the social democratic uh, project, let's call it, which, which of course in a way exhausted itself by, being, by its own success in some ways, you could say. Um, but the whole, um, you know, what explains it is such a large set of questions. But what I do think, which is really getting to the central point you just made, I think politics has become asymmetrical in this way. That, that until, let's say, 10 years ago, it was really about left and right in various forms. Though left-right is a European distinction, something like that also existed in the States too. But since then, and now speaking specifically about the States, but I think it's true elsewhere too, um, it's becoming asymmetrical in the sense that one side are, uh, are um, really engaged in this politics of win at all costs. So that changing the game to a game of just winning, a Schmittian game, if you like, is what they are up to. And the left, or the liberals, or whatever you want to call us, are faced with the very question you just raised. I wonder, just uh, I'll one more, and then we can open it up uh, to people. But um, you know, we, we were just watching this presentation about Hungary, and he was talking yeah. about the way that the right wing there, or the, 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 the ruling party now, has created a sort of parallel public sphere of, of media and intellectuals. Yeah. Um, and clearly something similar uh, has happened in America over the last 20 years with, with Fox News and in one end, but even on the intellectual level too, that there are publications now that sort of, uh, you know, where there are just clear partisan publications on the right. Um, I wonder if you could talk about just separable from being a politician or an activist as a public intellectual who has certain kinds of sympathies Hmm. What you see as your role at a time like this um, in relation to politics and truth. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, about my role, but I do think one implication of what I uh, believe is that these fields that I talk about, science and journalism and the law and indeed public administration, these are in desperate need, I think, in America of defense, of, of defense and self-defense. I mean, they're all under siege, not only uh, from you know, politics, as we see when you, you see uh, the abandon with which Trump and his political acolytes are attacking whole institutions. I mean, not just ignoring you know, what scientists tell us about climate change, and attacking, you know, the fake fake news, the the, the, the press, as as just, you know, totally um, not to be believed, not to be trusted, and um, as for the law, you know, the total disregard that that um, the Trump administration has for you know legal processes, uh, and manipulates it without 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 uh, restriction and also in public administration where he appoints into the uh, as leaders of the various as as heads of the various you know um, departments of state people who are totally opposed to the very you know the very missions of these very institutions so there's an onslaught attack but but in, in any case there are other reasons other complicated reasons why all these institutions think about journalism are under, are, you know, under siege, um, uh, partly to do with the market, for example. So all these things mean that these, what I call truth-tracking institutions or fields, have to not just defend, be, be defended, or defend themselves and be protected and be defended. They have to, um, they have to survive for any decent politics to, to proceed. And um, so I think, anyway, my first sort of response to your question is 
something like defend the fields, defend these institutions, because they're the necessary basis for any, any functioning liberal democratic politics. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the implications of the kind of political situation we're in, where there's this notion of politics as war, uh, it spreads outward yeah. into those fields. It does, Sometimes, yes. and not only because uh, they're being corrupted from the right, but there's a pressure on you, you know, as a journalist or as a uh, yeah. public intellectual to become more activist in response. And, uh, you know, I wa I'd wonder if you feel, th that's, that's something I feel sometimes, this sense of, or the question of how you respond to that. Um, right. But I think journalists have to be, I mean, or I don't have to be, but, I, 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 I'm thoroughly in favor of activist journalists, but they have to be activist journalists. And you mentioned Fox News before. One way of summarizing, summarizing part of what I'm saying anyway is to say, they aren't journalists. <laughs> They're propagandists. Right. Hmm. But sometimes it could be hard to tell the difference. Um, not in that case, but... <laughs> um, Okay, well, do people, do we want to open it up to questions? Thank you. In uh, trying to come to terms with this, dark, of the, with this darkness that is kind of casting a shadow over Europe and the United States, it's occurred to me that perhaps this is the default, the narrative, the main narrative after all, and that our surprise is that we've been living in kind of a pretend world. Tell me the what? Uh, we've been living in a kind of a pretend world. Since 1920, let's say, when democracy became widespread in Europe, um, we've seen uh, that liberal democracies fall. Yeah. By 1930, 33, there were very few liberal democracies left in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, they were authoritarian, uh, autocratic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that um, it's perhaps the American, the American, the space that America has taken up with its commonwealth or empire that's created a kind of a false surge of acceptance of its values, but now it's, a re it's receding back to its norm, which is tribal, authoritarian, yes, nationalistic. That that is indeed a dark, a dark thought. I mean, in other words, your idea is that we had a kind of respite, the 30 glorious years or something of a period when we suffered the illusion that somehow liberal democracy had a future, but that now we're reverting to. But isn't your vision of history a little bit foreshortened? I mean, the 19th century was, was not such a disaster, was it? And what about the Enlightenment? I mean, do we have to just somehow think that the, the fascist years were, were, the histo were the historic norm? I don't know. Just one more thing. We saw a liberal democracy fall in France in 1848 and here in Vienna in the 1890s yeah. uh, with the coming of mass participation in politics. Yeah. Um, or we, see it, we saw ugly sides of it appear in Vienna uh, around 1900. <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm sure I'm going to pursue these dark thoughts, <laughs> but we should perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So as, as a follow up on that, I mean, I wonder, you know, at the beginning you made this distinction between sort of big moral truths yes. and um, yeah. factual or smaller, medium sized truths. I mean, and, and, and you sort of said deliberative liberalism uh, puts the moral truths, uh, suspends them, says we're not going to decide that. Yes. And I mean, I wonder, following up on this question, if there's something that we're learning about uh, people's desire to have those moral truths decided, you know, to have a politics that speaks to them as opposed right. to one that puts it in, uh, puts it in abeyance, you know, yeah. while we figure out other things. Well, I think the putting in abeyance can never really be I mean, it's kind of an ongoing project which can never really be successful in the sense that obviously liberal democracy is committed to liberty and democracy so that, uh, you know, there are limits to this. But 
uh, a well-functioning, or let's say, a, a functioning uh, legal system in a liberal democracy has to be one where um, the, there is something like impartiality at work. And if that doesn't, if that's not the case, you, you um, so I mean, you have to be specific here. What what we mean? I mean, I think um, obviously uh, the more the more conflictual and 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 um, and, and we're seeing that now. Um, uh, antagonistic a society becomes in terms of contending identities, the more these institutions are put under stress. What I'm, by the way, what I think now, by the way, just to, since I mentioned that, is what we're seeing in the United States now, I think, is something like a stress test, like banks un, uh, undergo. I think we're seeing a stress test in which Trump's America is 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 in, un, undergoing a, stre a, a, a stress test, and the piece that that I, I, you, you you referred to that's not yet published, I I actually end up with the thought that if that if to be very specific, if if um, Trump fires Rosenstein and then Mueller gets fired and everything from the Trump point of view is successful. And it doesn't matter. That's to say, people in the end just roll over. Then really truth will have been, in Hannah Arendt's terms, have been proved to be impotent. Sorry to be so dark, but that's what I think. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm David. I'm a graduate of sociocultural and anthropology here. Uh -huh. um, uh, you reminded me, um, well, uh, you spoke of Hannah Arendt, and uh, we started actually with uh, a quotation from her. Yes. Uh, she was a, a woman who um, uh, also suffered quite uh, significantly in her life yeah. from... Um, uh, a political context in which uh, a kind of new masculine cult arose. Now, both the Trump campaign and uh, many others of the hard right recently have featured a kind of masculinity which, uh, which mm -hmm. claims to, to address some grievances, uh, which, which there ought to be in their view. Uh, what I wonder is, since women participate just as much as men, clearly, in producing reality and bringing things about, mm -hmm. um, uh, my question would be, is it true that this um, masculine campaign is really addressing uh, grievances of masculinity? Is there perhaps something to it? or? Uh, do we do we have to do with uh, is this a smokescreen? Is this perhaps their own illusion? Um, well, that would be the question. Mm. I can see several questions there. I'm not exactly sure what your question is. Um, I mean, I think that uh, I mean we certainly have seen. I mean, you just have to look at the at the. Uh, Television um, pre presentation of the, you know, the Kavanaugh story, the the, the that whole story of the uh, of Dr. Ford and the attempt to, um, you know, uh, give her so-called supposedly give her a platform and then basically crush her. That was masculinity plainly and fully visible at work. Um, so, but your idea is what that you're, you're interpreting the. The Trump phenomenon, particularly, is masculine domination. Is that it? Uh, no, it was rather whether whether indeed the the it is they are right that in a sense uh, masculinity is is ah. grieved, or uh, whether taking into account the important women in the importance of women in in any social context, ah, yeah. whether this is not uh, really hiding. Uh, much more than it tells about them, their, their, their obsession with masculinity. Yeah. 
Well, I do think, I don't know how, how far to go down this road, but I do actually think that the Me Too movement in America and its various other exemplifications in other places which are happening and which I know too little about is something new and that the rise of women's voices or the, the, the way in which they're now beginning to really have an impact, we'll have to see to what extent, will we'll, we'll show whether you're right. I think something new is really interesting and important is happening there. Yeah, I do think that. Uh, thank you. A philosopher who has also taken uh, some great deal of interest in media and especially alternative media. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that media or the press as an institution needs to be protected. Unfortunately, there's also such a thing as mainstream media, right. which provide lots of propaganda. And I'm not only talking about Fox News, but also about the so-called liberal or more democratic leaning media, such as, I don't know, CNN, MSNBC. So, uh, and those in turn provide Trump with actually legitimate ammunition for saying that the media are, are lying. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to, and I hope it didn't sound like that. I certainly don't mean to be idealizing or sentimentalizing the, what we might call the liberal press. I think actually in many ways you could say that they uh, gave all the oxygen and all the attention uh, to if we're talking about Trump, as I was, uh, to, to the Trump success. I think they played a very large role in, in that. So, I, I, and, and you say you're interested in the alternative media. So I think that that's where a great deal of the action is, of course, now. Um, and that's part of the problem about what I have in mind about protecting the norms uh, that, that, you know, uh, can in some way protect the tracking of truth, that in a way with the rise of so-called citizen journalism and, and the alternative media everywhere, this becomes all, all the more problematical. But the idea, in other words, the idea that, that I, I'm, I'm trying to stress is that really the idea that anything goes, that you know, it doesn't matter what's true or not, that's, that's what's involved in this, in this, um, in, in this project of, of of creating your own reality, that you you can you can make the 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 question of what is true and what what, what evidence is you can you can confuse you can confuse the situation so much that people don't care anymore. And in a way, I, I suppose that I might might have been what Tim Snyder was talking about. The, the the protection of factuality is, in part, has to be the protection of the. The, the norms and the institutions that are engaged in seeking evidence and, and, and verifying, uh, you know, stories. Thank you. Um, I'm Vin Kim. I'm from uh, Montreal. And yeah. I was wondering in, in your discussion uh, you haven't spoken much about technology because ah, what right. struck me is that, to, to be provocative, uh, that what seems to be driving this is, uh, you know, uh, as we've heard with uh, Facebook being manipulated yeah. and so on, is that what, what seems to have changed the game, I mean, you've mentioned Carl Schmitt and, you know, uh, Nazi Germany and so on, but right. what the difference is, is the difference now, historically, the media, this is the new thing, the, the, the social media. Right. No, I mean, I, that's clearly a crucial part of what's happened, and it's part of the answer to, you know, what's chi what is, what I think really, I don't know if you agree, but it seems to me to be a kind of tectonic, some kind of major change has, is, is happening, and that's why we are all talking in a different way than Fukuyama did now. And it's really no more than a few decades old, and technology, I mean, you're, you're really re referring to the internet, I guess. Yes, yes, to Facebook. Uh, Yes, yes, uh, uh, and 
There, I mean, I think, of course, there's all kinds of, I, I, I for example, I, I don't know if you heard Tim Sider's lecture. I, I thought he was far too unilateral about this. I mean, it was all really anti, anti the internet, his, his version. I don't think that. I mean, I think there are all kinds of ways in which people are at least potentially more informed, better informed, and certainly able to mobilize through the internet in ways that didn't exist before. So I don't, I think it's a, it, it has to be a, a two-way story. But on the other hand, I, I think that we really have to, uh, I mean, you mentioned Facebook, and, and you know, I'm thinking about, let's say, Cambridge Analytica, and that, those, those, all of that. And there, of course, truth is very much at the center of, what, of, of, of the issues. I mean, you know, finding out what actually happened is terribly important. You've got institutions which are trying very hard to do this. For example, a, a committee of the House of Commons, Commons entirely devoted to fake news. In the United States, you've got, you know, uh, the Russian Inquiry. You've also got, uh, the, you know, the um, uh, Mueller, Mueller Inquiry and, and other things. And then you've got other people discrediting it and discounting it and saying it's not true. All that is a battle about truth. And we've got to keep in mind the idea that that's, that's a major battle that has to go on being forced. Thank you. Um, thank you for all these uh, thoughts. I'm, I'm afraid I'm uh, maybe adding some more uh, somber uh, thoughts to, to the whole analysis. Oh, okay. um, I, I totally agree with you that um, there, there would be a need to strengthen these norms uh, around how truth is produced in a society. And I totally agree also that the media have, are a very strong field in which this happens. Yet when I look at that field, mm -hmm. I I'm under the impression that the profession of, of journalism already, uh, way before, uh, was under all sorts of um, pressures that took it away from there. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways uh, in which that happened is um, that the logic of the market got much more embedded in this, yeah. and that we, what we in Europe try to see as ridiculous, the idea that you write an article to sell it, that you write in it uh, the stuff that will sell it, uh, instead of the, the beauty of the argument or the mm -hmm. um, uh, comprehensiveness of the full story, has become the, the, the standard of the profession. Those are considered the best journalists that makes the uh, articles that sell best, that uh, get the most of attention. And I think this, this creates a logic of turbulence where uh, turbulence generates this type of uh, uh, attention. And, and I think this is already contradictory to, to any truth-finding mission that might exist. So I, yeah. I don't think, yeah. So my, my idea is would you, would you share that analysis or, or would you think I see it in a too somber way? Um, that's, that's the question. I think you're completely right. And um, you know, a, a, fuller, a fuller discussion of all this would have had to say what you so well uh, put so well, that, that, that all these fields, uh, science too actually, uh, certainly the law, you could say that what I've offered is a kind of idealized account of how they, how they are if they function as they should, if, if they function well. And clearly the market, the marketization of, of, of the journalistic field is, is a crucial part of the story of, of its degeneration, of the ways in which Journalists, to be good journalists, have to, in some way, resist uh, uh, the the commercialization of, of, of the very activity of, of, of doing the, of doing that job. Um, but something has to survive. Uh, in, in, if if the phrase "being a journalist" is to mean anything, and I think uh, you know, it does still count among journalists, doesn't it? Whether whether journalists recognize other journalists as being, de uh, being good journalists. It's the, the, in other words, there are norms of the profession which, of course, are constantly being undermined by the market. But the norms survive. And if they, if they don't survive, we're in real trouble. 
Yeah. I'm surprised that uh, not only you, but of course many other intellectuals, philosophers and so on, yes. still put so much emphasis on truth. Isn't it time perhaps to recognize that the other side, you know, we are on the same side of course when it comes to uh, the amount of people at the um, Obama or Trump inauguration. But, you know, the Trump side, you know, the Trump side, uh, Trump journalists, whole, uh, Holocaust deniers, creationists, Pizzagate advocates, uh, yes. climate deniers and so on, they uh, know the argumentation technique almost as well as our side does. Yes? In other words, uh, they talk about facts, about real facts, about true tell Alternative it it facts they talk about. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, it's so that uh, <laughs> you can say, well, you know, even occasionally now when there was the hearing two days ago, it was her truth uh, of Dr. Uh, and it was his truth, you know, when Kevin now talked, you know. So they don't talk generally about alternative facts. They talk about real facts. They do, so About yeah. the real, real reality, yes? That was that one question. And then, of course, there you could uh, carry on the discussion in a different way. But what I'm saying is, you know, there are amongst the climate uh, change deniers, there are people who have got their PhD from Harvard, Princeton, etc. So mm. there are as well a lot of intelligence people on the other side. I have dealt with creationists and all sorts yeah. of people like that. And they, you know, and when we admit that they use the argumentation technique, which has truth at its most important trick, uh, as well as we do it, then uh, we can say or admit that we use different examples. Now, I side, of course, with your examples, not with the example of theirs. But you can use that same argumentation technique to justify any arbitrary opinion you hold or not. Well, so I think it's perhaps about time that we stop this talk about truth. Really? <laughs> well, this, I, this is a very helpful question. Thank you. I mean, you said, you said one thing there which I completely agree with, namely that there are very intelligent people on both sides. <laughs> I mean, that I wouldn't dream, I mean, I'm not going to dispute that. But the thing is, I, I, I hear a hint of, more than a hint of, some sort of relativism uh, in, in, in your question or uh, your statement. I mean, it's true that climate deniers will say that the fact there's no climate change, or like Holocaust deniers, let's take that example, will, will claim to be stating truths about what happened in between 1939 and 1945. But what is, so what? I mean, the fact is, you say you side with me, but is this just a question of taking sides? Is that your view? I mean, after all, um, uh, the fact that someone may uh, make uh, assertions about the world and about history which have no basis in evidence, indeed contradict the evidence, the fact that they claim those things to be true so what? I mean, th that doesn't mean that we have to say, well, there are alternative truths. Does it? A short remark. Uh, I want to go so far that, of course, these uh, Holocaust deniers, etc., and so on, they know their philosophy of science well. They can talk in Popperian terms. I have been in discussions with uh, young Earth creationists, and so on, and so yeah. on. But uh, I do believe, you know, what when you talk about evidence or reality and that, that evidence is mute. It needs speakers here on this side, you know, of the game who mm. talk on behalf of them. Scientists, uh, scientists, climate change deniers, you know, in, in religion it's uh, popes ah, or, or okay. theologians and so on. So the evidence is mute, you know, we speak on behalf of the evidence. They speak on behalf of the evidence and we do. So uh, the evidence can support both sides, you know. Well, it's per perfectly true that both sides can appeal to evidence. But look, I do want to make, uh, you know, this, is, this can get very, very complex, but let's keep it as simple as we can to make, to, uh, provided that we go on understanding each other. I think that, uh, you know, I made this distinction between big truths and small, small to medium-sized truths, you, you helpfully said. Okay, so if we're just, if we're talking about, let's say, facts, uh, of a very straightforward kind, like how many people attended the presidential inaugural. Or we're talking about something more complicated, like um, is there climate change, uh, man-made climate change? Or even more complicated things, like questions about inflation and about the economy. In all these cases, evidence counts. 
and scientific, uh, cons scientific consensus counts in the sense that you have to persuade your fellow, not only human beings, but fellow scientists, that the evidence supports the conclusions. Now, uh, when you say, I mean, the, the, the examples we've just given of the Holocaust denial and the climate change, the fact is, it's, it's not the case that, uh, you know, you've got the same kind of degree of consensus on both sides. The, the people who make those claims are, are uh, making, uh, they're cranks. I mean, they're making claims which are not supported by the evidence. If we don't say that, and we just say, well, there are just alternative truths. I mean, there are, there are simple-minded and there are complex ways of saying that. The complex way, I think, is Foucault's, to say regi there are regimes of truth, so that truth in the end is in some kind of function of power. I think if you go down that road, and I don't know whether you do, but if you go down that road, it seems to me you've given up the game. I mean, at this point, uh, there, I agree. If, 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 if that's what you think, we should stop talking about truth and only talk about power. I mean, one just follow up from what he was saying. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about truth. I mean, one of the, the, the problem, though, is I think one of the problems he was bringing up is you can make the arguments with the evidence, and yeah. they'll just give you other ah, evidence. That is true. That doesn't change the fact that one thing may be true and the other isn't. But I guess one thing it brings up is a question not so much of truth as of trust. Oh, yeah, how, absolutely. And, and I wondered one question sort of, to, you know, are there places where you think where you see dialogues or, or things, ha institutions where we can build trust so that, so that there can be a conversation about truth? I mean, isn't there kind of like a... That's the big question. I think trust is broke, breaking down in politics. That's the, well, another way of describing the new, uh, the new world we're in. Uh, I mean, it's true, just empirically. I mean, if you look at, uh, so far as what they're worth, if you look at um, uh, you know, public opinion polling and all that, it's true that the level of trust in politics has been massively in decline. Um, but but uh, just, uh, just relating to this question about, you know, people can appeal to evidence on both sides, of course. I had an uncle who was um, uh, in New York who was dealing with the um, claims of Holocaust survivors. Uh, and um, one day, uh, a famous Holocaust denier, whose name was Butz, Butz, um, he invited him to his office and showed him all the files of the documentation. And Mr. Butts looked at it all and then said, it's all hearsay. <laughs> so of course it's always possible to resist evidence and to make these kinds of claims, but I mean, I, I, you know, whether you're Foucault or whether you're just some kind of undergraduate attracted by relativism, the, 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 if to make the move that's to say that there, which is what Kellyanne Conway said, that there are alternative truths, uh, it's just a road I'm not willing to go down. Arendt actually makes this point. She says you can, you can, the politics can destroy truth, but it can't replace it. Right, <laughs> yeah. But of course, the Arendt essay is really just as much about big truths as small truths. And oh. we, I, we have to make that distinction, I think. This is such a great conversation. I want to bring it back to the metaphor of war. Politics is war. Mm. And it occurs to me, if one side is playing by the war rules, like whatever works, we're going to just go for it and we're going to destroy you, right. then you're at war. Um, it, it isn't, war isn't something that both sides agree, let's have one. Um, and so if the, in our case in the United States, the Democrats, uh, are always trying to compromise, or always trying to find some yeah. new path, then they're just losing. Uh, that's, yeah. uh, for example, I just read something that um, the Democrats may offer a deal to Trump. You say goodbye to Kavanaugh, and we will promise that we will confirm your next person. So, um, yeah. in other words, Trump wins. He doesn't care if it's Kavanaugh or some other guy he or gal. No. He just wants his judge there. It could be anybody. Right. Um, and he, would, in fact, would do better to, he, he would then get the credit for having abandoned this unbelievable misogynist rapist. Right. Um, so I guess my question is, what would the argument be that the Democrats or the liberals in, you know, in, in other situations shouldn't just go to war? 
so that in heaven people will say, oh, you were so virtuous, that's really great, you told right. the truth, and now you're all dead. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't think there's a general answer to this very important question. I mean, I think sometimes you do have to go to war. Sometimes you really just have to swallow your hopes and your hopes for prefiguration and just take your gloves off. But I think as a general strategy, it has to be self-destructive. Because when that does happen, when, let's say, the left, whatever you want to call it, does actually engage in um, militant tactics without restraint, it, the, the outcome is never good. I mean, I think that really did happen, uh, I have to say, um, uh, as part of the history of communism. Uh, you know, Trotsky, uh, in his famous essay, Their Morals and Ours, basically said, let's put an end to all this P P Quaker priestly talk. We're at war. All this liberal stuff is for, you know, people engaged in, in, in the kind of politics where, you know, you're in a kind of safe harbor. But we're at war. And I think that, um, you know, what you just said there is right, uh, maybe at a, at a certain moment you have, which is what I think, by the way, Michael Moore is arguing right now. Take the gloves off. Well, that, that's a tactical question. And maybe, and, and maybe this Kavanaugh case is an example of it. Maybe that was a really bad deal that the Democrats made. It probably was. But then in that particular case, you have to think, well, maybe, you know, if you hold out on Kavanaugh long enough and the Democrats take the Senate, maybe we'll able, be, be able to win without sacrificing too much. Um, I, in other words, I don't think there's a general answer to this. But I think as a strategy rather than tactics, taking the gloves off has to be a bad idea. One more? The last one. Mm. Okay, I want to come back uh, last time to this question or this distinction between uh, the drive to win the game and the commitment to the game and its rules. Because um, on the left side you could have the comfortable position to say, well, we are losing, but at least we are playing by the rules. At least we are the good guys, whereas the other side is yeah. bandering the rules. And on the right side, many are celebrating, but some certainly think, well, this is awful, we are winning, our side is winning, but we have abandoned the game and we have abandoned truth, which is mm -hmm. also difficult. So I imagine yeah. on both sides there's this tension between how to deal with this situation. Um, maybe you have some thoughts about, or observations, how that's dealt with on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think you put it very well. I didn't hear every word you said, by the way, but I, I think you put that very well. But I think that obviously in any real political movement with political leaders and, and, and people involved, you're going to have this very debate going on. And you've got it right now, for example, in America among Democrats. There are Democrat politicians who are really um, quite, you know, very uh, ruthless, um, have very ruthless temperaments and want to go all out. There are other people who, you know, are much more, how, how should we say, moralistic or believing in the importance of prefigural uh, tactics. I actually think, you know, as I said just now, I, I, I don't think we can generalize, just be really aware of the problem uh, and, and not be inclined. I mean, okay, one of the things I really object to in the sort of Foucault, Carl Schmitt vision is the idea, it's a sort of reductivist idea that, you know, we can, that, that, all, that what really counts is winning. I think what counts is, is restoring, which is I think where we are right now, restoring the rules of the liberal democratic game. There is though, you know, the, 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 it, you can tell from the way you set it up, there's a psychological uh, incentive to just say, well, there are, you, you, re, you remove the tension if you just say the rules don't really exist anyway. All right. <laughs> that there, there's an easiness to saying that. Mm. Um, so, any last thoughts? Uh, Many, but too many to, uh, <laughs> to summarize. <I> okay, <laughs> well thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we can continue the discussion among ourselves. Thanks.